So in this part of Clickers in the Classroom, we're going to talk about participation and specifically the participation list. Oops, let me get going here. So the first thing we're going to talk about is participation in general. In other words, not tracking the student, which we'll talk about later. When we're talking about participation and clickers, this is just about getting everyone to connect to the conversation. This is a great place to start if you're a little bit nervous about how the clickers and the information is all going to come together. So for now, we're going to uh, talk only briefly to give an overview of what's possible. Later on, I'll tell you how to actually put these things in place, okay? so. If you enable, this is something we're going to talk about later, the show responses. Okay, that's going to be this chart here, and again, there's all kinds of options. And this is an example of a multiple choice question. And, you know, obviously you're going to have question a question written right here, and you're going to have as many responses as you want. And the system can show a graph like this. And what I can tell as the instructor is that the students did not understand what I was talking about, right? Um, because nobody got the correct answer. Now, a lot of people thought that the correct answer was C, which is not correct, but maybe there's a reason and maybe I need to talk to the students as a whole. Now, what you'll find when you display information like this is that the students will say, I was not alone. There's a big portion of the class who also thought that this was the correct answer. So they're a little bit more willing to talk to you and to say, this is why I thought that the answer was C. Now, you know, the students who were in this middle group will also say, look, it wasn't just me. There were, you know, there were several students who thought that the correct answer was B, so let me tell you why I was confused. So that's a nice thing to know. You'll also see up here, and again, there are so many options, and we're going to talk about this, but I want you to feel comfortable that this information is available to you in real time as you're using the, the system, and it's not complicated. The system does all this stuff for you. It'll say, this is eight responses. Now, maybe I have 10 students in my class, or maybe this is 18 and I have 20 students in the class, whatever it is. And so I can say to the students, as they're weighing in, you'll see this number go up, four, five, six, seven, eight. I can say to the class, all right, now we've got 10 more seconds left to answer. I'm about to close the polling. And so only eight of you have weighed in and get the students to respond. So you get this type of information, which is a great gauge of participation. There's no judgment. You can be anonymous, but yet still weigh in with your choice. But as the instructor, it gives you some great feedback. Now, when I say to my students, um, I only see eight students that have responded here. Uh, the ones who have already responded are not confident that their answer has been there. They, it has been accepted by the system. They can look at their clicker pad at the screen on the clicker pad and see that they, you know, selected, let's say, C, but they only get that feedback immediately after they push the button. So they get a little nervous and they start trying to press the button again. Now you can tell the system to accept you know, the first response only or to allow them to change their answer or whatever the case may be, but they do get a little bit nervous about that. So another thing that you can enable that tracks participation is this response grid. And the response grid is going to sh simply show you who has responded. Okay, so it doesn't, they're still anonymous, but the student has the ability to look up there and to say, uh, oh, this is mine right here, number 74. You know, I, that's me, so whew, my response has been weighed in. Now, you'll notice that they're color-coded, which is kind of neat, because they don't know who the other answers are, who the other uh, person is, but this purple might be A, this kind of light green might be B, this one might be C, and so it does give them and you at a glance uh, a little bit of an indicator what they're, you know, starting to, to go into. Now, you know, I will tell you this too, let me go back to the graph and just say a neat thing about displaying this chart, this graph, is that you can have it display in real time while the students are answering, or you can have it display only after all responses are in. If you display it in real time, an interesting thing happens that you may already be assuming, which is that the students start to talk to each other. When they talk to each other, they tend to change their answers. 
that can be good and that can be bad. This is something that you may want to, um, to change up periodically. One thing that I find when I display this graph in real time is that the students start talking to those students sitting next to them. And they'll say, hey, I just saw this bar bump up to 63. Was that you? I just saw you click your, your response pad. Why do you think it's C? I, I said it was B. And the student will say, well, this is why I thought it was C. And the other student will say, no, 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 it, it's B, and this is why I think it's B. And they may convince each other to change their answer. And so what I find is, especially if there's a countdown timer ticking on this question, that you can get substantially more discussion in 30 seconds or one minute that you have assigned to answer this question than if you simply asked a question out loud and told the students to discuss it amongst themselves because they want to be in the winning answer column. So it creates teamwork amongst the students and it forms little bitty pockets of teams despite the fact that you are tracking them individually or that you're seeing the responses individually. So we're not tracking yet. This is just from the classroom, but you start to see the participation, I should say, individually, and you see the responses change. Now, you may assume, and, and maybe other faculty would assume, well, they'll all navigate to C because they would see that answer C is the correct answer. The smarter students are answering that one, so they all go over there. But sometimes the class is wrong. And that really gives you an opportunity to say, why did you change your answer? I noticed that somebody was in there. Speaking of calling on students, if you say to students, in a, you know, in the case like this, um, why didn't you answer with this correct, with A, which is the correct answer, when they see that they're, you know, in the majority, that other people answered that way also, they're much more likely to explain things to you like, well, I didn't understand the question. I knew that concept, but the way the question was worded confused me. So all kinds of good information comes out of this. Okay, so again, the response grid. Now, let's talk about the tracking aspect, which starts to get just a little bit, not, not too far advanced, but uh, brings a little bit more more of the features to you there's two ways to do it one way is very simply to use a sign-in sheet this is something I do all the time specifically I do this because my students do not own the clickers and they don't keep them they're turning them back in every class now if your students do own the clickers or if it's something that they take home with them then you might want to investigate a participation list and we're gonna show you both ways um, when we talk about tracking, the thing to understand about tracking is it's not uh, something that you have to say, oh my goodness, how do I configure tracking? The response system knows. The clicker system knows. When you push the button on this particular clicker, you know, that clicker has answered. And so the software automatically tracks the student responses using the clicker ID. The problem is what student goes to what clicker ID. So you can either use a sign-in sheet so that they tell you what clicker they had that particular day or you can type up a participation list so that the system knows that this student goes with that device ID. Now here is the sign-in sheet and this is actually something that I use in my class. I simply change the names but I pass this sheet around and I say listen uh, to take your attendance today make sure that you sign your name so that I know that you were here and I, I give them my little box of clickers and I say when you sign in take one clicker out of the box flip it over onto the back and look for the clicker device ID. And so Bluto would write that his clicker ID was 947, I know this is cut off here, but 947DA9. And then he would pass the clicker box over to Bugs Bunny. Bugs Bunny would pull out, um, you know, his um, uh, clicker. He would sign in and write down his clicker ID, okay? So that way at the end, you know what student used what clicker. Okay. Now the participant, and that's all there is to that. And I'll show you the reports and things that are possible, but uh, later on, the participation list does require just a little bit of setup. It's not bad at all. Um, it does require that um, you assign clickers to a particular student. I've seen people do this in a lot of ingenious ways. I've seen people use those little clear shoe holder bags, and um, each student's name is put on one of the shoe holders, and their clicker stays in that shoe holder bag. Uh, maybe you have kind of a filing system for them. I've seen people actually just tape or put 
post-it notes or something on the clickers so that the students can very easily find their name uh, rather than having to remember a, a device ID because the device IDs are typically six characters and they are a little hard to remember, okay? Uh, now, there's two ways to do this participation list. One is to manually type it in directly into the clicker system, and another way is to import the information. Uh, but that's be being said, let me go ahead and, and go to that now. What we're going to do is from the main menu of the clicker dashboard, we're going to go over to the manage tab, and I'm going to show you that. Um, Okay, so here we are. The first thing that I would point out to you is that as you build participation list, you'll see them over here, and that's kind of nice because you can select them and then uh, view the data from previous uh, polling sessions. I'm going to go over here to Manage, and there again you see my uh, response system here, and you know, kind of all kinds of things that you can look at, even with this existing list, I can edit my participants or results manager. This one's kind of empty, so let's just start fresh. Notice that I can say new, okay, and I'll name this, uh, I'll say this is a practice uh, participant, uh, yeah, let's, let's, let's say it's a practice PL, practice participation list, and I can type in as much or as little of this as I want. Now, naturally, I have to have the device ID. I would type that in, last name, first name. User ID can be an email address, just as a convenience. It's whatever you know you want to do with that. You'll see some of the things. I can save this list. I can print the list, which is nice. Come back in later or edit it. Um, demographic has to do with one of the types of questions that you can ask people, uh, in particular teams that you may put them on. Uh, anyway, all kinds of things that you can do, uh, you know, a as you're doing this. I'm going to cancel. Just wanted to show you that. And I want to go back to participation list, and I'm going to import it. Now, if you use a course management system, you may already have your student names in that course management system you may be able to export them from that system and then import them uh, later on, which is what I plan to do now. Um, so here's a, a turning point. It says import a turning point participant list, or maybe you have this from a file like D2L. Now you do have to have permissions um, to import this, and at our college, I'm not sure that we do. At least it hasn't worked for me. Um, but anyway, so you can just kind of um, uh, see you know, the different features that are available for you there. In my case, uh, I'm going to choose a file. And I'll tell you what, hang on just a moment. I'm going to pause it. So this is Microsoft Excel, and I wanted to show you the file that I had created in anticipation of importing it. So here's the device ID, and I've typed all these. Be very meticulous, uh, because if you mistype one number, and this is true whether you're typing it into something like Excel or whether you're typing it directly into the system, then when that student clicks, it may not register their device. Like if I had an 8 here instead of a 9, then the system would not find that device ID. Um, you know, last name, first name, user ID, and so you can see the information there. So I'm going to close that. And here's my participation list. Now, this is, I said Excel, but it is a CSV file instead of an XLS file. Um, if you're familiar with Excel at all, you just create it in Excel. When you save it, instead of saving it as an Excel file, just save it as a CSV file. So I am going to click on Open. And boom, there it is. And here it is. It took the name of of the file, participation list, um, and uh oh, I see that I have a little problem here. It put my um, user ID in, or put my device ID in the user ID. Okay, well let me go in and edit. Very strange. Do not know why it did that. Let's see. This is kind of a real time. How about that? So, you know, sometimes it's not a presentation until something goes wrong, and so you see how easy that is. That just worked out uh, great. I am not sure why that um, 
put that information into that column, but you saw how easy it was just to copy and paste that over. So that worked out very well. Now that I've done that edit, I'm going to save and close. And again, I have my participation list, so I'm ready to go as each of these students answers. We've covered a lot in this particular um, ONIC. Okay, and it created a new one for me. Okay, so we're kind of learning together. Like I said, not a presentation until something goes just a little bit uh, haywire. So uh, now we know in the next part of this, I'm going to show you, we're going to get into the meat of it, and I'm going to show you how to start setting up questions using the PowerPoint uh, polling. But for now, that's all for this part. Thank you very much.